Well, it's so good to have every one of you here. And for all of you who are watching online as well, welcome to the gathering. Uh, I'm really excited about what God is doing. He's, he's, he's doing something amazing. I really believe that we are entering into incredible seasons in this world. I don't know why, I just have this compelling feeling the church must be prepared for what's coming. I believe that uh, difficult times are coming for the world, and the church must be prepared. And when God gave me this verse, uh, it's interesting because many people have been asked, which of the three parts of that scripture do you like? All of us like the hidden treasures part. Yes, that's, right. that's the one everybody likes. But to get to the hidden treasures, there's a few things you have to pass through. The first is you have to be resilient. Amen. And there's a, a way that we're going to be called to grow in our resilience. Um, and so you, you become resilient, and when you're resilient, then you're able to give yourself fully. Because many times when you're not resilient and you're being shaken, you can't give yourself fully. And then when you give yourself fully, then the hidden re results, the hidden uh, treasures become normal for you. And so I really sense that this is a word for us for the season, that God wants to raise us up to be an unshakable people. Now, I want to talk today, uh, I, I really, as I prayed about this, I really felt like God wanted me to talk about backsliding. Wow. Backsliding. Um, and for those of you who are old enough, you might be thinking I'm talking about a dance move by Michael Jackson. <laughs> but anybody who was good at backsliding, anybody who can demonstrate to the Gen Zs? Huh? Pastor Noel. I hear you used to be a back, used to know how to backslide. Come and demonstrate. The Gen Zs, the Gen Zs need to know what a backslide is. Can we, can we, can we come and demonstrate? Let's appreciate Pastor Noel. <laughs> she used to be a, da a serious dancer, by the way. Ah, yeah. Just show the Gen Zs. Like, what, what, was a, what was a backslide? Yeah, you know, like Michael Jackson style. Come on. Hey. <laughs> What a pastor! <laughs> so for those of you who are Gen Z's, you don't even know who Michael Jackson is. That's what a backslide used to look like. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about dance moves here. We're talking about backsliding. And I want to talk about why Christians backslide, you know? Uh, it, backsliding really is a Christianese term. It's, 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 it doesn't, it's not really an English word in that sense. It's a Christ, we use it in a Christianese way. And what it is, by the way, you know, you know Christians have their own language, huh? That nobody else understands. So it's a Christianese language word. And it really means losing your faith. So you can imagine somebody who had faith, vibrant faith, and then the next day you come or another time you come and you find they have no faith. So that's what backsliding is. And we want to start by just talking about backsliding. Because remember, we're being told to be un- Shakeable, but not everybody's unshakable. And people backslide for different reasons. In fact, it happens to many today. Now, it's very interesting. Pastor Kuria assured me if I click on this, my slides will move. All right, yeah, there they go. All right, thank you, Pastor Kuria. I like it. Oh, wow, come on. Hey, magic. All right. I point that way, not this way. Eh? Let me tell you, you can take the villager out of the village. <laughs> but there's an element of villageness you cannot remove from a villager. Unashamed, I'm telling you, this is just the way it is. But that's why you need to have sons who are, who are Chanuka, eh? Have serious people around you. Yeah, have people who can make you look good. Yeah, have, have good sons around you. So the Bible says the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The implication there is that not everybody will stand firm to the end. There are some who will not stand firm to the end. Uh, it's very interesting because, again, the scriptures say that, uh, again, this is the same scripture. By the way, it almost seems like the same scripture, but I read uh, the one before was Matthew 10, 22. This is Matthew 24, verse 13. Jesus repeats it again in a completely different context. And he says, but the one, let's say it together, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And then it says again, Matthew 24, verse 13, let's read it together. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Now we're going to come back to this authority thing because I think it's a very important thing. But the first thing you need to understand is Jesus is saying not all his followers will be victorious and do his will to the end. 
So there are some who will do it, and there's a reward, but he says, but to the one, because he understands not everybody will get to that place. Not everybody will do his will to the end. And it's interesting because Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus talks to seven churches. There's a, a, a revelation of Jesus to seven churches, if you remember the seven churches. And in every single one of them, Jesus repeats the same words. To the one who stands firm to the end, I will give. To the one who stands firm to the end, I will give. Every single one of them, he gives them the same promise. Because again, the implication is, not everyone will stand firm to the end. My desire today is to help you to stand firm to the end. That you will not be among those who are shaken, those who backslide, those who lose their faith. You know, it's very interesting because one of the reasons God gives us his word is to warn us. Because he tells us, uh, it's interesting because he says, for we are not unaware of his schemes. We're not unaware. The enemy has schemes. <laughs> and the Bible says, we are not, Paul says, we are not unaware of his schemes. And it's very important for us as a church not to be unaware. Tell your neighbor, you can't be unaware. There are many who are unaware. By the way, even in this church, for those of you who've been here long enough, you probably know at least one person who is no longer walking with Jesus, who is no longer as passionate about Jesus. Somebody who was a Mizizi leader, somebody who was passionate about helping others, somebody who was passionate about worship, loved Mavuno. But today they're not standing firm. They've lost their faith. Or maybe they have a watered-down faith. Because not everybody stands firm. And so I believe that God wants us not to be unaware of the enemy's schemes. And so I want to talk about biblical descriptions of backsliding. You know, for us, when people backslide, we say things like, they'll say things like, oh, I no, I no longer feel church. I no longer feel this Jesus thing so much. I, I go online nowadays. Like, like me and Jesus are not as tight. In fact, we're on a, I'm on a break with him. Have you ever had people say that? Yeah. That's the way we... I left the church, not God. I left the church, not God. <laughs> You'll hear people saying many, many things, you know? Uh, God and I on parks. <laughs> there's a whole deconstruction of faith among people today. And there's just a sense of, you know, I've, gro I've outgrown this thing. But you need to understand that when the angels look, when heaven looks at somebody backsliding, it doesn't look that way. It doesn't look that way. There are biblical descriptions of backsliding. Let me give you what backsliding looks like to an angel. It is a drinker of polluted water. What that is talking about is somebody who's completely ignorant. And in Jeremiah, Jeremiah talks about, by the way, these visions of what a backslidden person looks like to heaven. And he talks about the first description. He says it's like a drinker of polluted water. He says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So imagine with me that you're walking in a village and you find people and they're drinking polluted water. This water, animals have been defecating in it. People have been washing clothes in it. It has Bilhazia. It has things floating it. And everybody's just coming and drinking. Wow. And you look at them and you're in shock. But then you realize that just next to that polluted place, there's a stream with clear water that is flowing. Wow. But they're even jumping over that stream to go and drink the water that is polluted. <laughs> what would you say about those villagers? Either they're cursed or they're ignorant. Like, seriously, don't you guys know this is why you're falling sick? Don't you understand that there's water flowing, that is moving water? It's alive. That's what you need. You don't need the polluted water you're drinking. But that's what Jesus says. When he looks at people who have backslidden, he sees drinkers of polluted water. God is saying to the Israelites, by your backsliding, you're becoming drinkers of polluted water. You're dying from a disease that doesn't need a doctor. It just needs wisdom. <laughs> you know, you can actually cure your whole village by just understanding where to find the real water. Wow. And you remember Jesus telling the woman in Samaria, when I give you the water, it will overflow from you. It will not even become stagnant once you drink it. It will continue to bubble and become life for other people. Wow. The source of living water is there. And I'm sure the angels scratch their heads and say, how ignorant. Why would you ever walk away from living water? The source of your life. How ignorant. 
can you get? Please tell your neighbor for me, why would you want to be ignorant? Like, why would anybody choose ignorance? It doesn't make sense. And I believe many angels in heaven are just asking, why would these people choose ignorance? Why would they choose to move away from the source of living water? Another, another um, um, let me see. Have I gone backwards? Don't worry. Forget, forgive your shower, Pastor. He'll get there. All right. I think I've gone the wrong way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll get there. I'll get there. Number two, a corrupt and wild vine. A corrupt and wild vine. That's something that is worthless. So again, God says through Jeremiah, I'd planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? So the picture here is a good plant. It was picked well. It was grafted well. It was planted well. But when the owner came back, he found it had turned wild. It had become, it was bearing, instead of good fruit, it was just bearing thorns. It was actually even polluted. It was messing up his farm. And the man is looking and thinking, this thing was valuable, but now it's only useful for being pulled up and maybe burnt or buried or used for something else. It's not useful to the farmer. And the angels are looking down from heaven at somebody choosing to walk away from God, and they're thinking, why would you choose to be worthless? You are valuable. You had worth. You are important. You are meant to rule nations. This is why you are made. Why would you willingly choose to be worthless? And in heaven, I think there's a lot of shock. The angels are like, what a shock. This one now is sitting at home saying he doesn't go to church. What a shock. How can he choose to be worthless? In the spiritual realm, that's what you've just done to yourself. You've removed yourself from the place of value to a place of worthlessness. And I believe that God is looking and saying, my goodness, why would you choose to be worthless? Tell your neighbor for me, why would you choose to be worthless? Why? The third description. The third description. The third description. No, no. Have I gone too far? Okay. Pastor Korea, it's not me. It's not me, it's you. Ah, okay, all right, all right, all right. I'm about, okay, there you go. It was me. No, it was somebody at the back, I'm sure. A wild camel or donkey. <laughs> this one's really interesting because that stands for unrestrained. Wow. Unrestrained. So, so what, what God asks these guys is he says, see how you've behaved in the valley. Consider what you've done. He's talking about Israel. They've been apostate. They've run away from their faith. They've decided to chase other idols to go, to go do their own thing. And he's saying, see what you've done. You're a swift she-camel running here and there, a wild donkey accustomed to the desert, sniffing the wind in her craving, in her heat. Who can restrain her? It's a very graphic picture. Some of you are farmers and you get this picture. Some of you grew up in town so you have no clue what this is about. <laughs> Animals go through what they call the, the heat cycle or the oystra cycle. And basically what happens when an animal is on heat, it becomes uncontrollable. So if you've ever seen uh, dogs, some of you might have dogs, when a dog is on heat, it will basically eat the fence, impale itself, jump over and even, even break a leg to go find a mate. There's something within it that just drives it. It's no longer in control of itself. It's unrestrained. Even if it knows by escaping where it's going, it's probably going to get killed where it's going. It will still go. Because it's being driven by animal instincts. It's unrestrained. And, and the angels are looking and saying, you, you are in a good place. You are looked after. You are provided for. Why would you want to do this? You know, I'm a farmer. I've, had, I've, I've, I've actually seen this happen. I had a really nice dog. And it did exactly that. It, it, and, I, and I knew, by the way, we had put a nice fence for it. Because we know if this dog goes out there, the neighbors will kill it. There are some people, are, are, it's, it's a farming community. They don't like dogs around their chickens and all those things. And I knew this thing, it would be fine uh, if it's protected. But of course, it chewed the fence one day when it was, I, I should have just dealt with it and castrated it. Anyway, sorry, this is too much detail for some of you. <laughs> but I didn't. 
And one day just dug a hole. I mean, I didn't know dogs could. Dig. It dug a hole, like a tunnel. Because it could smell some females on heat somewhere else. And it went, and sure enough, it was killed. Wow. And I was thinking, you had a nice home. <laughs> you had guaranteed meals every day. You had somebody who looked after you. Somebody even washed you to make sure that you didn't have fleas. You had it good. You even had a nice kennel. And by the way, I used to give it like it was fed now. Like we used to even, I, like I, I was so into that dog, I used to buy it human food. Like I'd buy for it, I wouldn't, not in, I didn't used to buy dog food by the way. I'd buy like ugali, you know, like, like proper ugali from the thingy. And you know, that, that, the one that even you can eat. In fact, I think my, help, my worker used to help himself to it. Huh? And then I'd buy omena. Those of you who are from here, you know what omena is. Like I wanted nothing but the best for my dog. Um, and I mean, I was looking, I'm like, you had a nice home. You had an owner that was buying you food that he could eat. Now see how foolish you are. Now you've gone and died. You know, I'm look, I think the angels are looking at this person thinking, why would you do this? Wow. Why would you choose to be unrestrained? Why would you leave the place of shelter and protection and go to the place of death because you're unrestrained? And this is what angels, when they're looking down at somebody who's choosing to walk away from their faith. And by the way, sometimes people backslide, but they haven't left the church. Wow. Wow. Yeah? Can I, can I go there? Because it's like marriage. There are people who left the marriage, but they're still in the house. And they gave up on the marriage a long time ago. But they keep their appearances because it's like it's, it's more work to leave than it is to stay. And so there are people who are in the church because it's just more work to leave. And anyway, where will I go? And so they still do the church thing, but they walked away from their faith a long time ago. And the angels are looking and saying, why would you want to be unrestrained? There's a beautiful place that God has for you. He's your shepherd. He will lead you to green pastures. Don't walk away from that. Ask your other neighbor, why would you want to be unrestrained? And then there's one more picture. There's one more picture. And I'm just telling you, when, when heaven looks at somebody like this, they're all, like the angels are in shock. They're like, I can't believe anyone would choose this. And the last picture is a bride without her wedding dress. A, wife, a bride without her wedding dress. Um, I think I'm just going to let the guys at the back help me out. Uh, a bride without, number four, a bride without a wedding dress. Could you move the slides for me? So with this one, the picture is somebody not normal. Abnormal. Jeremiah 2 verse 32. Does a young woman forget her jewelry? A bride her wedding ornaments. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. You, you can imagine that it's like God is puzzled. Like, just think, it's like, imagine you're a groom, and you're standing in front, you're wearing your best suit, your best men are with you, everybody's wearing cologne that costs like a few months' salary, and the church is just all the flowers and the, 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 the lights and the, the fairy lights are twinkling and the music is playing and the, the bridesmaids have marched in and everybody's excited and everybody can't wait to see what happens and then the bride appears and she's wearing the same torn jeans she was wearing yesterday and she has a hairnet on her head and she hasn't brushed her teeth and she's just wearing her, her bedroom slippers and they're, they're, they're saying here comes the bride and she's not even mad, she's just like, what's up? She's like, what's up, guys? Like, 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 you just, like, tell me, what do you think about that, right? Somebody's gonna be crazy! Like, what are you doing? Are you mad? Like, like, every bride dreams about their wedding dress. Every young, by the way, when girls were small, I used to, by the, it's, I had, I had, <laughs> boys and girls are so different. When, when, when girls are young, like, they, when there's a wedding, they go, they want to touch the bride, they want to touch the cake, they're fantasizing about how they'll be looking when they're married, and then when you ask the boys about, they just say, uh -huh. we're going to a wedding, will there be food? <laughs> we're so different! Girls look forward to it. They want, it's like, 
by the time you're wearing that dress, you've thought about it. It's something you've looked forward to. And the angels are looking and saying, and, and God is like, are you mad? Like, how do you come to your wedding without a wedding dress? Like, you come in your jeans. Are you crazy? And this is the picture that heaven has of somebody who throws away the wedding uh, dress that, the, the, that, that God has planned for them. God has said, I will dress you in white. I will cloth you. I will, I will put jewels on you. God has said that there's this big feast waiting for you. And it's like, you're not even ready. You don't even want it. You've walked away from it. And the angels are scratching their heads and thinking, somebody's got to be crazy. <laughs> By the way, I, I give you this picture because it's very important for us to understand that faith is the most important thing you have in life. Wow. It's the most important. And if, nobody, if anybody doubted it, the fact that you're alive right now and you've not eaten for 21 days should be proof enough that it's not food you need. It's not food. Yeah. By the way, if you had all the money in the world and you couldn't eat, do you know how miserable you'd be? We had a friend who's a, who was a billionaire. And literally, he was a billionaire. And uh, yeah, yeah, I've got friends. <laughs> I know, I say things and you guys look at me like, this guy is making this stuff up. <laughs> all my stories are true. And this guy, he was, he, he was a billionaire. The reason I say it was is because he passed. And he was a billionaire, but then he got throat cancer. And so he couldn't eat anymore. And so they had to feed him through a tube in his stomach. And there were these things that they would put in, the little cans he had that you'd put in a tube and eat. And I remember it was so interesting because this billionaire friend, he could, he could buy anything. He could afford anything. He, and he was a generous and God-loving man. Could afford anything. And I remember that he would buy us, he'd, like he'd take, you to, he'd take you to a nice restaurant and tell you order what you want. And when I say nice restaurant, it's not probably what you're thinking. <laughs> it's a nice restaurant that are, by our billionaire standards, you know. And we'd go, and, and, and the thing is, he'd want your company. So you'd be sitting there eating steaks and all the nice things and salmon and all those nice things. And the guy would just look at you and he couldn't eat it. And in the evening, he'd just go and put a little tube and eat through that. So I'm just trying to tell you that it's not, it's not money you need. <laughs> it's not food you need. The most important thing you need is God. Wow. Without God, you are nothing. You have nothing. And the angels look and say, why would you choose to walk away from life? Wow. Why would anybody in their, in their right mind choose to do that? And maybe let's look at that, because I want us to look again at why people backslide. And again, remember, this is to help you. This is to such you will, not be, you will not be caught unawares. The fact that you know people who are backslidden tells you that you're not that special. I have friends who are backslidden who I looked up to, who are mentors to, to me. Wow. People who I thought had great faith. People who had great faith, by the way, when I became a believer. People who even preached to me before as a believer. And people who I looked up to and I thought, this guy has such amazing faith. And they lost their faith. I even know pastors who led great ministries who lost their faith. So why would I think I'm so special? Why would I think it can't happen to me? And that's why it's important for us to understand why people backslide. Are you understanding now why you need to understand this? Because when you get it, then you're able to say, okay, what do I need to do to ensure I don't go the way of those who've gone before me? So there are seven reasons why Christians backslide. And the first one, and I'm going to talk about the first one I'll, I'll get from the parable of the talents, it's a Sunday faith. A Sunday faith. Now, you're going to probably notice, you probably know people who are in this category. In the parable of the talents, Jesus talked about some of the principal results, uh, reasons why people backslide. And the first one he talked about was the seed that fell on the path. In Luke chapter 8, verse 12, he said, those along the path are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word of God from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. So these are Sunday faith people. They come to church and they actually hear because they didn't say they don't hear, which means they must have been somewhere where the word was being preached, right? So they come to church and there are people who come and they're here to hear it. But the thing is, the minute they hear it, as soon as they leave, it's stolen away from their hearts. They come to church because that's the thing that people do on Sunday. They listen to, to the sermon, it goes in one ear and comes out the other ear. And it doesn't have anything to do with their lives. It has little impact. There's a coolness towards the things of God. 
their Sunday life is very different, different from their Monday to Saturday life. By the way, even as I'm speaking about this, I can already see people in my mind who fit into this category. If you ask them whether they're Christians, they're card-carrying Christians. If you ask them which church they go to, they'll even tell you which church they go to. But that's about it. But you're going to notice they're not very passionate about the things of God. The things of God are just, there's a category for God things that has nothing to do with their Monday to Saturday life. Uh, they do their God thing because the God thing has to be done. And then after that, they're done with that. They're Christians in church the rest of the week. They are practical people. If you visit their office or their home, you will actually think you visited the wrong person. Their language is different. Their dressing is different. Their behavior is different. Their talking is different. What they watch is different. I remember one of my good friends who's actually here. I'm sure he's here. We've not talked today. But before he was, when he was still a Sunday Christian, he, he tells me this story. And I won't even, even try and look for him because if I look, I'll laugh and then you guys will know who it is. <laughs> Let me look at Pastor Kevin instead. But I, he tells me that I walked out of church one day after a sermon and he, he greeted me. And I don't remember the story, but he remembers it vividly. And I, he was with his girlfriend in the car and I said, hi, how are you guys, everything, and then I left. He says, what you didn't know is the car almost burnt because I'd thrown the cigarette uh, under the seat and I was trying not to talk loudly so you could smell the smoke because you assumed I was a very good Christian. I didn't want to spoil your illusion of me, you know. I mean, the things people do. I mean, the, guy, the guy said I was waiting for, to see smoke just trickling, <laughs> trickling up in the car because the guy was a complete different... The, who he was on Sunday in front of the pastor is completely different to who he was the rest of the week. Do you know anybody like that, by the way? Very different lifestyle. When, you, when their pastor meets them, in fact, they are very, very solid, staunch member of the church. First Corinthians 15. They can even memorize the verse and share it with everybody else. Yeah. True story, by the way. And this is the way it is for Sunday Christians. It's like they come to church. It's a ceremonial thing. They do it. Maybe it's a thing their parents did. It's a thing that was done. Maybe you can even become an, a deacon in the church if the church has positions. They are good with people. But basically, it's a thing you do for Sunday. It's your Sunday category. Wow. You have another category for Rotary. You have another category for the club. You have another category for the office. You have another category for your golfing buddies. It's like all those are very different lives. And there's no connection between them. And here's the thing. If you're in this place, even if you think you believe in God, you are at great risk of backsliding. Because that word is being stolen from you for a reason. Satan is stealing it from you because he knows he has you in his target and in his sights. And so the first is the Sunday faith. The second is the shallow faith. Shallow faith Christians. And this was a seed that fell on rocky ground. It says in Luke, 18, Luke 8, 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. But they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. So this person not just hears the word, they actually have joy when they hear it. That means they might even say amen. They might say that was someone was anointed. Amen. My goodness, pastor was on fire today. I love the word. Come on, somebody. Yeah, they were happy. They received the word and they were happy when they received it. They even love listening to the sermon. Maybe they even have a favorite preacher. On Spotify. They follow you on Spotify. <laughs> By the way, I know I, I, it's so funny. Every, every category, I can, I'm laughing because I can think of someone. It's like I told me, Pastor M, I love your sermons. You just tell me, when you're preaching, I'll be there. <laughs> In other words, what you're saying is, when you're not there, when you're not there, even me, I'm not there. <laughs> These guys get inspiration from being in church, but the Bible says they have no root because they don't know God for themselves. Yeah, they're used to the pastor knowing God for them. They don't read the word for themselves. They prefer to outsource it to their pastor. Pastor, you inspire me. Give me the word for the year. Yeah, give me the word. I want a word for my business. Give me the word. They don't want to wait for the God to give them the word. The pastor can give it to them. They don't fast and pray for themselves. They outsource it to the 430 prayer group. Yeah, please, guys, pray for me. <laughs> because they won't pray for themselves. Oh, sorry. Am I, am I, am I muted? <laughs> they don't serve in ministry. They feel it's something that other people, they can leave to other people. 
Either they feel like maybe there are people who are more qualified than them to serve, or maybe they feel they've done their time. That's the other dangerous group. Eh? There are people who've done their time. Let me tell you, if you hear about their Christian pedigree, they were serious in their day. Man, they served God in CU. In high school, they were known. They prayed and fasted and, and spoke in tongues. They locked themselves in rooms for 24 hours to pray. They were known as leaders everywhere. But these guys nowadays, they sit in church, and then they come and greet the pastor after the sermon and say, well done, pastor. Yeah. I, by the way, I, brought my child. I even brought my child for the pastor to lay hands on. Because they believe that, yeah, somebody else can do it now. I've done my time. Wow. My goodness. Let me tell you, this is a very shallow place to be. You can have known Christ for many, many years. And one of the things I said yesterday is, there are many people who look like they're 20-year-old Christians, but they're actually one-year-old Christians who've been one-year-old 20 times. Wow. Wow. And that's not a place to be proud of. You've been, you've been, you even, you even look respectable. You know Christ, you, 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 you think you know Christ, but there's no fruitfulness in your life. And the problem is, as a church, we tend to endorse those people. Those are the people we might even call up to pray. Those are people who are mature. They know the word. They've got experience. But they're not fruitful. They're not fruitful. They have a shallow faith. And let me tell you what happens. When shallow Christians go through, through a difficult time, they stop attending church. Wow. Yeah, they give up. They give up. They say, look, I've served. Don't peep. I mean, God, they feel like God owes me. Yeah. Like, seriously, how can, how can God let me go through something like that? And they stop attending. When they face criticism or opposition, they get confused. And they don't know what to say. And they just completely hide. When shallow Christians see a scandal with a Christian leader, they forward to all their friends. And they even now, they even hide under the surface. Like, what are these Christians? You, you can't even know they're a Christian, by the way. They just take cover. They're undercover. And, and, and you know, the problem with somebody like that is like, and for me, I'm like, what does a Christian leader's faith have to do with yours? Like, seriously, you work out your salvation. Yeah. By the way, if Pastor M ever backslides, you should say, that's him. That's his problem. I can never backslide because my pastor backslid. Never. Never. It has nothing, his faith has nothing to do with mine. Yes, he's my disciple, but my disciple. But if he leaves the Lord, I am staying with the Lord. When I was in college, that happened to me as a young Christian. My disciple backslid. In fact, he joined a cult. And I was a brand new Christian. I was in Nairobi Chapel. I was being discipled. I was in college. And the guy who was discipling us came and told us, I no longer believe I've joined a, a group. Then, of course, he can't say I've joined a cult. And when we did an investigation, we were like, this group is not a church, it's a cult. Yeah. Wow. And we just said, Away. Yeah. I'm not going to follow somebody who's not following Jesus. And so fortunately for me and, my, and the little group that we were part of, we're all young Christians, but we all made a decision. Uh-uh. And we went to our church, and we served in our church. And by God's grace, he's a good friend. He actually came back to Christ. And he slid, he slid forward. <laughs> God brought him back to his senses, and I bless God for that. But listen, your leader's faith is, is their faith. They're working out their faith with fear and trembling. Yeah. By the way, you have no idea whether I prayed this morning. You have no idea. Yes, there's a gift that God has for me, for you, through me. But I'm the one working out my salvation for myself because that's what the scripture asked me to do. So even as you receive the word I give you, receive it as from God and work out your salvation. Yeah. And if you ever see me doing the wrong thing, don't follow me in doing wrong. Because Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. The minute you stop doing that, you've joined a cult. You're doing your own things that are not the things that God is calling us to do. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. By the way, I want everyone in this church to know that verse. Because I want you to follow your leaders. I want us to be good followers. But I want to fo you to follow your leader as they follow Christ. That's going to always be the guardrails for this church. To ensure that nobody teaches you or leads you into error. And when I teach you the word, go back into it like the Bereans. Write the notes. And go into it like Bereans and study it for yourself. So that you're able to see, is this God's word for us? Look for my fruit. The Bible says, by, your, by their fruit, you shall know them. So observe my life. Paul says to, to, to the Corinthians, observe my life. 
Yeah, you need to observe my life and see, is there fruit? Am I just teaching guys theory or am I living the things I'm teaching you? But you can't allow yourself to be a shallow Christian. Shallow Christians are easily dissuaded. When things, when there's arguments, when people in their family disapprove, when something happens, your husband tells you you can't love God and they choose, you know, it's like you stop, you, you, you lose your faith because of someone else. They get dissuaded easily. It's interesting because Jesus was in a place where his own family did not approve of his ministry. They didn't want him to serve God the way he was serving. They thought he was crazy. They heard he was even not eating because he was so busy serving. And they're like, this guy is mad. We need to help him. And they, they planned an intervention as a family. Have you ever seen that part in scripture? Yes. The mother and the brothers came. And they, I'm sure they had had a family meeting and said, now, who is going to be the first one to talk? Who will be the one to detain him? How will we manage? You know, he's your older brother. So you guys have to help me. Mom is like, you guys have to help me. I don't have the strength. And they went. This is actually, it's a real story in the scripture. Read it for yourself. And in Luke 8, verse 20 to 21, it says, Someone told him, your mother, your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. <laughs> Jesus knew what the problem was. He knew they had come to pull him away from ministry. And so what did he say? Jesus said a very harsh thing at this point, which it's interesting because if you read it out of context, then you think Jesus disrespected his mother. But you need to understand the context. Because what Jesus was saying is, listen, ha, huh, I am about my father's business. Yeah. And what did he say to the crowd? He said, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So he didn't go outside. He didn't go to them. He ignored them. Because he knew my father's business always comes first. I always serve God first. In other words, I know why I'm serving the Lord, so my parents, my family members cannot change my mind or dissuade me. They cannot pull me away from doing my father's business. Listen, if you are in church and you have a shallow faith, you're one step away from backsliding. Wow. The only reason you have not backslid is because the, the pressure hasn't come yet. Wow. But it will. And you're one step away from it. Number three is divided faith. The third cause of backsliding is divided faith. Representing by, represented by the seed that fell among the thorns. It says uh, in Luke chapter 8 verse 14, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. This one's very common, by the way, in church. It refers to Christians who have a divided mind. They love God, yes, but they also love other things. They love God, but they also have things like money crowding their lives. They're, 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 they're consumed thinking about money. If you hear them thinking about money, you think that's all they dream about. That's all they think about. Their career, their spouse, their success, their family, their social media, their fame. They can't. I mean, there are some Christians, if you tell them to fast from social media, they die. They die. I noticed people didn't respond to that one. Because <laughs> some of them are right here. <laughs> they die. It's like, ask for anything else, but don't touch my social media. It's like I wake up and it's like, where is my phone? And it's like, yeah, I get it. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm swiping. It's like I'm swiping. And that's before I've even had my quiet time. I'm swiping. I'm already seeing what have people said on WhatsApp. How is the world going on without me? And it's a very dangerous place to be, by the way. One of the things, by the way, I'm, I'm laughing with you. Because <laughs> let me tell you, these things are addictive. They are designed to addict you. And the people designing these this, this gadgets and these uh, forums are much smarter than any of us, including myself. They are much smarter than any of us. So I even feel sorry for our young kids because if I have a problem, what about my son? What hope do young children at five to six with their gadgets, their mother's gadgets have? And these things are just designed to... So one of the, one of the commitments I've made to myself is when I wake up, because I wake up really early, I'm usually up by three or four, and I commit to myself, I'm not going to look at social media before I've read God's word and spend time in prayer. If I don't do that, because the problem with it is the minute I see it, it sets a tone for my day. The minute I see what's on WhatsApp, it determines how I feel. Somebody sent me a bad WhatsApp, I can't even pray now. I'm just thinking about that WhatsApp, that message, what it's going to do for my day. So the first thing I do is I just say, done. I read God's word, I finish, I post, I finish everything I'm doing, I spend time in prayer, then after that, if I really need to look, I can. But I thank God for the 21 days. I'm so happy. By the way, I'm even wondering whether I really want to go back to social media. 
it's it's such a really I give you your phone, eh? My wife is like, give me the phone. <laughs> yeah, but we have made a commitment in the evening by six, we put our phones off. Because we're realizing we're just in a world that they're idols of the age that compete with our faith and they cause us to have a divided faith. How many know that God's blessings can be dangerous? Yeah. There's no idol that was not first a blessing. Yeah. Every idol. Every idol was something that God gave that was good, that somebody turned into a substitute for God. That job that's an idol, it was God-given. Yeah. Those people who can't come to church because they have children, those children were prayed for. You, it was a prayer item until it became an idol. And now you can't show up for prayer because you have children. And that's how idols, idols are always blessings that were corrupted. Wow. And, and, and you know, the thing about it is when blessings become more important than the blesser, it inevitably, here's the weird thing, it always opens the door for worry and stress. The devil is so interesting because his blessings always bring stress. The Bible says the blessings of the Lord, they make rich, they add no sorrow. Let me tell you, the blessings of the world, they always add stress. They always add sorrow. I'm getting a bit warm. They always add sorrow. They always add stress. They always bring worry. So you take that thing. You take your bank account and make it your God, and you will never have peace. You take your job and make it your God, you will never have peace. It is not the solution. But there are some people who don't come to church because of jobs. Let me tell you people, God's people, one of the prayers I'm praying, and I want us to even pray in this gathering, is that God will remove you from that job that doesn't allow you to serve God. Amen. And give you a job that allows you to serve him. Yeah. <laughs> Where is Simon Kagwe? Is he here? Yeah, Pastor Simon. I love this man. So, Dr. Simon, because that's, that's his correct title, he got an offer to do a job. Okay, I kind of think I know your story. I'm probably going to murder it. But I got an offer to do a job in Rwanda that was very high paying, very high prestigious. It was a great deal. It's a kind of dream that everybody would say, dream job. Look what the Lord has done. Answered my prayers. He's an acceleration. He's an acceleration. <laughs> Simon, what did you tell them? You turned them down, right? But then you gave them conditions. And you told them, where is a mic? Can, can a man speak for himself? I cannot be speaking for people. Let them speak for themselves. Dr. Simon, you, you are given a job, but you, you told them, I'll only take this job on condition. Maybe yes. tell us about that, yeah. So yes, African Leadership University had invited me to move to Rwanda to be the second uh, in command after the dean for their MBA program, the executive education. So they had asked me to move there I'd say they'll pay uh, my relocation costs, uh, they'll provide space for my, for, for my family as well, and, and, and school fees, and everything for the children. But God had told me it's not a time to leave. I am planted uh, here in, in Kenya, at downtown uh, specifically, and God told me uh, I'm a pillar at, at downtown, my dear wife, so I needed to stay. So I told them, they need to come. You have to, if, if I'm going to work for you, you need to work terms that will work for me. So they had to they had a meeting between the dean, the finance, and the HR manager to discuss how they would make my 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 work work here in Nairobi to, to make it a, a remote work. So that was the the plan. They, they had to sit down and create recreate the structure of the of the team to allow me to work from here. And they gave you the job, but now you get to work and still yes. be a pillar in your church. Yes. So the, the, I can still work from the comfort of my house. Yeah. Here's a Christian who says, God has not said I move. I'm a pillar in my church. So if I'm going to take the job that I'm qualified for, then you make it work for me. Who does that? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I'm saying that sounds crazy to a, a modern day person. Like why would you tell a boss that? Like it's a dream job. Jobs are not found everywhere. But here's a man who's willing to say, God, if it's a job from you, it will fit the calling you've given me. Many of us will take the job first and then we figure out what to do with our faith afterwards. 
Yeah? We tell our pastor, by the way, pastor, I am going. <laughs> Pray for me because I'm going. Where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> On the way to the airport is when they're saying, Pastor Sai, meet me at the airport and pray for me. I've been given the job. But guys, my prayer for you is that you will have jobs that allow you to serve the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. And you will be so excellent in your jobs that they will hire you anyway. And they will give you those positions. But they will respect you as a man of faith. But I love, I love, I love Muslims because they don't hide their faith. If you're hiring a Muslim, you know you're hiring a Muslim. Not, it's not just his name. He will tell you. For me, if you're hiring me, by the way, I need a prayer room. <laughs> and organizations hustle to make sure there's prayer room. And your canteen doesn't have halal food. How are you hiring me? They will, by the way, they'll turn over their canteen to put halal food in there for that person. But you Christian. They tell you, Sunday's here, we work. Pasi, I'm sorry, I can't be a zonal leader anymore. Because nowadays, you know, I work on Sundays. I'll follow online in my office. <laughs> Guys, what I'm trying to say is there must be a paradigm shift for us as Christians. We can no longer just flow with the current like everybody else. You stand for something or you don't stand at all. And divided Christians do not stand. They will lose their faith. Matthew 6 verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other. Or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It says you can't. When you try to serve them both, you will end up hating one and loving the other. It's impossible. I mean, think about it. You're actually going to be in a place where you'll either hate your job because it's keeping you from serving the God you love, or you will hate God because it's keeping you from serving the job you love. Wow. Wow. So why put yourself in that position? Determine for yourself from day one, this is my God. This is the one I'm following. Everything else helps me follow him. That's how to not be a divided Christian. Who does your schedule say you serve? You know, most Christians are more influenced by their favorite politician than by the word of God. Yeah. This is just the way we tend to be. We know the, enti the name of our, the entire lineup of our football team. But we don't even know the 12 disciples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, we don't even, we, we don't even know, we've not even memorized scripture because our mind is full of memory of other things that are irrelevant. You know, one of the things I've noticed when you scroll, you know how, you know how the algorithms bring you those reels? When you stop after a few minutes to ask yourself, what value have I just added to my life? Most of the times it's net zero. There's nothing this has added. But the reason, I'm, the reason I'm talking about that is because most of us are too busy to sit down every day and just sit down and memorize a verse. Sit down and memorize a script. That word is life. It's life. In heaven, that word will still be relevant. But we're going to be there scrolling to see now people in Texas are fighting with people in whatever. Wow. Oh my goodness, Ukraine hasn't done what? Wow. India. How is that helping you? It doesn't help us. And it's time for us to begin to understand that I cannot have a divided faith and hope not to backslide. Wow. If you have a divided faith, you may love God and have no intention of backsliding. But unknown to you, your faith is being choked by weeds. Wow. And eventually, you will not have a faith at all. Wow. And so that's number three. Let me share two more. Two more. Number four reason why, why, why Christians will not stand is stagnant faith. Why many people backslide. It talks about the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but they go on their way and they are choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they don't mature. That's stagnant faith. You know, it says we must always be adding to our faith. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a minute. That was a verse for divided faith. That was a verse for divided faith. 2 Peter 1, 5 to 9. Thank you. For this very reason, make every effort to add. I want you to notice that word. To do what? To add to your faith, goodness, and to, to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, I like that, and to perseverance, godliness. And then just keep going. And to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. 
For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have already been cleansed from their past sins. Wow. You must always be adding. Come on. Add. He says, yes, you have. But now add. Yes, you, you, yes, 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 you had faith. Add goodness. And now you have goodness. Add knowledge. You had knowledge. Now add self-control. You have self-control. Now add perseverance. It's like there must always be something being added to your faith all the time. You see, faith is, is like life. If you're not growing, you're dying. You can't be at the same place you are in faith a year ago and you think you're alive. At the last gathering, there must be a difference in your life by now. There must be progression. Here's the thing, your body has not stopped growing. Since you're here in November, there's already changes in you. Some of you have a white hair you didn't have. Some of you have a huh? January body. Some of you have January body that you didn't have. Something has changed. Time has not stood still. Progression is moving on. But your faith could end up being stagnant. It's in exactly the same place that it was. And, 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 and Peter is saying we must always be adding to our faith. I love the fact that a few years ago, many people here could not pray regularly for 10 minutes sustained every day. But now we pray one hour effortlessly every day. And by the time it's over, most people are like, Allah, an hour is finished. Praise God, that is growth. I mean, can you believe this January? We prayed three hours. And I had people telling me, Pastor M, can we continue with the three hours? What a shock! What a shock! <laughs> like, my goodness, Mavuno people want to pray three hours a day. I was like, my goodness, I was not even ready. By the way, we we're just doing it for a week. And people were like, Pastor M, let's continue. I'm like, no, I'm not even ready. But the people of God are ready. They're like, we're ready. We've got prayer muscles. We can pray for three hours. I was like, praise God. That is growth. There is progression. There is moving. I, I, I thank God that some of you had not read the Bible, but now you read the, you've read the Bible twice, three times. Some of you are reading already through the New Testament the second time or the third time. Praise God. That's growth. Something is happening. Some of you could not even have fasted for one day. <laughs> now you do 21 day liquid fast. Hey! You know, by the way, it's interesting because I used to look at uh, Muslims in fasting and I think, what a hard thing to do. What a hard thing to do. Have a big meal in the morning, then wait the whole day, and then have a big meal in the evening, and then wait. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry I said that. It's like you're fasting between meals, you know. I mean, even those days, <laughs> even those, yeah, it's like. Yeah, even those guys, those days of six to six, I'd be like, my gosh, I'm doing a seven day six to six fast. Wow. My gosh. Add to your, Add to your fast. Liquid. Liquid. <laughs> <laughs> and now some people are almost ready for water fast. Yeah, it's coming. It's happening. I mean, by the way, some, of, some people in this room, and I'm not going to look at them, they are, they're continuing. They're doing, they're doing 40 days. I know them. Yeah. Some people here, if you combine how many days they fasted last year, I'm not even looking at them, Pastor James. <laughs> I'm sure they even hit 100 days last year, by the way, combined fasting. I mean, this is crazy. Like, God's people are actually growing. We are actually growing in our faith. Now, the thing itself is a practice. But you know that practice just makes you better for the game? Yeah. What you do in practice is what you're going to do in the game. And we're growing in our faith. We're adding to our faith. Come on, somebody. Tell your neighbor you're growing. You're growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People who have stagnant faith, they have relegated their faith to a safe zone where it does not interfere with the rest of their life. Wow. Yes, you've been a DG for years, but you're not even willing to leave and start your own. That's a stagnant person. You're afraid of change. You're afraid of doing things the way you've, they've never been done before because you want things to stay comfortable. You want them to stay safe. But when it comes to faith, if you're not growing, you're dying. Some people have been saved 20, 20 years, but they've not led anybody. They've not discipled anybody. And it's like, look, you're stagnating in your faith. You must add 
to your faith. I mean, I love it when you meet old people. Uh, one, one of my, one of my, uh, my, my godfather is actually now in his 90s. He's even in a place where he's, he's got uh, dementia and, and is not as healthy as he used to be. But the most amazing thing for me is I remember Pastor Karo and I a few years ago just marveling because well into his 80s, this man would do a 40-day fast, liquid fast, every year. And you look at him and you're thinking, my gosh, you still fast at this age. He loves God. And he would do it alone. It wasn't that his church was doing it. It was his thing. He loved God. He would seek God for himself. And it's such a beautiful thing to see a Christian who's not retired. Like he's old, but he's still seeking. He's still pressing. He's still loving God. Still conquering new territories for God. I never want to be a retired Christian. Yeah. I never want to be a comfortable Christian sitting down watching young people doing the work. I want to serve God all my life. I want to die serving God. Yeah. yeah, by the way, my dad, you guys know my dad passed away last year. This man died serving God. Until a month before he died, the man was preaching every Sunday. And he was retired, by the way. He was even retired as a pastor. You know, if you retire as a pastor, you should say, this man at least has even served God. He has planted churches. He should even go and rest. But every weekend, the man was still preaching the gospel. And I'm like, yes, that's how I want to go. I don't want to be a retired Christian. I never want to have stagnant faith. I want to be as excited about Jesus as I am now. I want my daddy in heaven to just feel my love and my joy and my passion for him even when I'm in my 60s, 70s, 80s. I want to be vibrant in my faith. I never want to be retired. I never want to be a comfortable, cool Christian. Yeah, that's stagnant faith and it's a risk. It's a, it's a huge backsliding risk. The fifth one is bad company. Yeah, your company. By the way, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's a, very, it's a very true, it's not in the Bible, but it's true. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, this is how the Bible puts it. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You know, the friends who are influencing you as a Christian should be friends who have vibrant faith. Surround yourself with people who want to grow, who are passionate about what God is doing, who are looking for new horizons. Yeah, always surround yourself with people like those. Let me tell you, by the way, it's not comfortable to be on the growing edge. It's much more comfortable to, be, to have arrived. Um, I remember just very interestingly, I was telling my wife yesterday how we have some friends who are very close friends of ours and we've intentionally made sure we're close to them because they have a way they challenge their children. They've challenged their children to grow. That is fascinating to me. And, you know, for us, it's very easy as Pastor M and Pastor Carol to feel we've arrived. I mean, we've done Lair, like, how many times we can teach it. Our kids have been sort of model kids in some places. We've kind of done our job, huh? And it's very easy to feel, especially to just surround ourselves with people who admire us. But I say, I want to surround myself with people who I admire, who are doing things we are not doing. Every time we're with that particular couple, I'm always like, oh, gosh, we're such bad parents. <laughs> what? They tell us the things they're planning for their kids. You're like, oh, God, we can't even start there. Let's just, let's, let's at least have a plan for how we're going to get there. And it's a beautiful thing because it keeps us growing. It keeps us moving forward. But you know, if you surround yourself with people who just look up to you and all they think is that you're the best, guess what? You will settle there. And you'll stop growing. And bad company will always corrupt good character. It's, it's a principle of gravity. You, <laughs> things don't naturally go up. They actually naturally go down. The force against you is always downwards. So if you surround yourself with people who think you're all that and that's all, then you'll always find yourself going downwards to where they are and settling to those standards. If you surround yourself with stagnant Christians who just want to keep meeting and feeling good, then guess what? Chances are that's exactly what you become. If you're in a DG where nobody wants to do anything exciting, nobody wants to plant a DG, nobody wants to do evangelism, nobody, people just want to meet and be cared for, guess what? That's exactly what you'll become. That's exactly what, you're just going to end up becoming stagnant and happy, happily well-fed sheep <laughs> the rest of your life. Yeah. Wow. If you surround yourself with people who think that making money is the most important thing in life and the only thing people should be concerned about, you will become like them. Yeah. I've got friends that I had to pull away from because that's all the conversation is, is about. It's about this money and making this and becoming rich and, and this hustle and this deal. And at some point you're thinking, guys, there's more to life. That can't be all we talk about. 
And at some point, you're like, if I stay with these people all the time, I'm going to become like them. Now, I'm not saying don't become friends, but I'm saying choose who influences, who influences you. Wow. Choose which friends you hang out with because you want them to impact you. If you surround your friends with yourself with friends who think it's too cool to serve God, retired Christians, guess what? You will retire before your time. Yeah, because even you will feel it's too cool to serve God. You'll end up just like them. And let me just say for single people who are in the house, be careful who you marry. Your spouse is the single most important decision for your faith you'll ever make. Yeah. It's such an important decision. Because if you marry somebody who thinks it's too, they're too important to be in church, they're too important to serve God, they're too important to follow, yeah, and they think all this, this is just stuff that you guys are making up, guess what's happening? You will become like them. Wow. You will become like them. Your spouse will greatly affect the quality and experience of your faith. I remember one of my friends who really wanted to serve God. Had a heart for God. He was a gifted pastor. Early days of Nairobi Chapel. And I was a young intern then. And this man was gifted. I think Pastor Curry remember him. And he had, I've never seen a girl wanting to serve God. Those days I didn't even want to be a pastor. I was just an intern. <laughs> but this guy really wanted to serve God. He was so gifted. But his wife, all she wanted to do was be a banker. And she thought it was very uncool for her to be married to a guy who preached. I think she just had a bad impression of preachers. Maybe it's a background thing. Her, her background just made her think lowly of preachers. And she just didn't feel comfortable being married to a guy who preached. And this guy wasn't a preacher when she married him, so I think she felt he had changed the deal on her. And so I remember the guy coming to Bishop and saying, Pastor Oscar, I, please talk to my wife. I mean, you need, you need to talk to her. She really doesn't want me to do this, but I feel compelled. I feel God is calling me. And I'll never forget what pastor said. He said, look, when you said I do, you said, I said the words, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. He said, you go home and serve your wife and pray that her heart changes. Yeah. Basically, he was saying, I'm not giving you a job in this church. You're not moving in, al along in ministry. Go and serve your wife because you made that decision. And, and I remember just watching him so broken, so broken. Now, my prayer is that God, God blessed his, because God, God gave him the calling. I believe God didn't give him the calling in, in, in a way to mock him. And my prayer is that as he prayed for his wife, he saw a turnaround. But you know what? Until the turnaround came, he was constrained to not serve God the way he wanted to serve God. And that's a sad place to be. So, single people in the house, choose wisely. Huh? Look around the gathering. That's where people who love God are. <laughs> exhibit, exhibit A. They're here. <laughs> when you're having tea, walk around looking. Uh -huh, which are the single men who come here? Who are the single women who come to... Those are the people you should be hooking up with. They love God enough that they're willing to put him first. <laughs> All right. I know I said two more reasons. Can I give you two more to finish? I've, I've just got a couple more that I think will be important, and then we can go for tea. Uh, number six, overconfident faith. Overconfident faith. Yeah. An overconfident person is a person who trusts their own strength and abilities. And the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, so if you think you're standing firm... Be careful that you don't fall. There may be somebody who's even listening to this and saying, preach it to them, pastor. <laughs> it's a good word for other people. <laughs> me, I'm not here. You know me, I'm not at this level. Uh, me, I'm, me, I'm past this. But preach it. Give them these basics. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, the basis of overconfidence is pride. And as they say, pride comes before a fall. Yeah. You know, an overconfident Christian looks down on people who are weak. He says, I can't understand how people struggle with fasting. Like, I mean, guys, get your act together. I can't understand why you never read God's word on time. Like, you're, you're, you guys are always, like, catching up. What's up with you? That's an overconfidence. Because you're like, me, I, me, I've sorted this thing out. I've passed. In fact, if you guys are in nursery school, me, I'm getting my master's. You know, it's like we're in a very different league. That's an overconfident Christian. And it's a highly dangerous place for you to be as a Christian. There's an interesting parable that talks about a Pharisee who was, uh, Jesus gave this example of a Pharisee, and he said in Luke 18, verse 9 to 12, to some who were confident 
of their own righteousness. Are you, talk, are you seeing an overconfident person? Yeah. There are people around Jesus who just felt like me have arrived. Like, I don't even know why you guys are struggling with these issues. And Jesus say, he look, and, they look, and they looked down on everyone else. He, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. You know that story, right? The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. Hey, shh. How many of you fast twice a week? I mean, this guy was advanced. Yeah? I give a tenth of all I get. I mean, even tithing. I, these are small things. I've mastered all these things. Let's go to verse, the next verse. I give a tithe of all I get. And then he continues to say, oh, that's where it stops. Sorry. Okay, that's all I've given you. I give a tithe of all I get. Okay. He, he's boasting, basically. He feels very happy with himself. He's like, Lord, me, I did the 21-day liquid fast. In fact, I even drank water. This guy, some of them were taking smoothies. I don't even understand these Christians in Mavuno Church. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like butternut soup when you're fasting? Like, who does that? Like, like guys are even struggling with fast fruits. Like, Lord, like seriously, in this church? And I mean, they really, I mean, it's like, look down on other people. It's like, look, I've arrived. I don't have those struggles. But guess what Jesus says? Only one of those two men was justified before God. The Pharisee is the one who looked at himself and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he didn't deserve even the gifts he was giving, even the knowledge he had to tithe was given by God. He didn't deserve it. Somebody taught him. He's like, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And the Bible says the one who said that prayer is the one who got justified. The Pharisee, God ignored his prayer. God ignored his prayer. An overconfident Christian is blind to the fact that they are one step to backsliding. In fact, they're probably already backsliding. They just don't even know. So I think that's a very dangerous one. And then lastly, offense and disappointment. Offense and disappointment. Let me just say, this one is so, so big. It happens so much in the body of Christ today. A reason why people backslide Offense and disappointment with other Christians and especially Christian leaders. Maybe the pastor passed you in the street and didn't say hello. And there you are throwing yourself, ah, pastor, you know. <laughs> or maybe the pastor spoke harshly to you and rebuked you. Or they failed to call you after promising to call you. Maybe a leader was involved in a scandal in your church, in your discipleship group, somebody else, and you saw them living a double life and you are so disappointed people tell me all the time i saw somebody living a double life i was so disappointed i said i'd never be a christian again i'll never follow jesus whether it was an affair or divorce or something the person did something outrageous and the sad thing is for, for for some christians when they see this they stop going to church altogether they're like i can't handle it's i love god but it's just christians i can't stand and they, and they stop going to church but listen to me all christian leaders all spiritual leaders make mistakes. And some deliberately even lead double lives. I think you need, to, maybe I just need to say it for the people of Mavuno so it doesn't shock you when it happens. Is it okay if I say it? Please rem remember this. All Christian leaders mess up. All of them, because they are human beings. Come on, somebody. Ah. They are not angels. And they are not Jesus. All human leaders mess up. Abraham, he lied that his wife was his sister. His sisters owned his own wife. <laughs> and then after that, he slept with a maid. Like seriously, you guys, that is scandalous. Like a guy who sleeps with a maid. And we call him the father of faith, the friend of God. <laughs> Moses was a murderer. I even think he stammered because of how he murdered a guy. It's like every time he thought about it, like the guy was just like, like the guy killed somebody in cold blood. And yet he's the greatest leader in the, New, in the Old Testament, the bringer of the law. The meekest leader in the whole scripture. David. I know some guys are already on David. Poor David. 
That guy had issues. He's a wife snatcher. And not just from strangers, from his friends. By the way, if you read the story of David, it's so scandalous. Because if you read how David, when he was in the wilderness, being chased by Saul, who are the guys who defended him? It was his mighty men. These men laid down their lives for him. Like they were, they were willing to even sneak through enemy territory to steal water. Be not, not because there was no water, but because he was missing the water from the well near his house. And then after that, he takes the man's wife and then kills the guy in cold blood. And the man carries his own letter to, to, for his execution. Unknowing. I... Jambasi, you. And that's the man we say that he was a man after God's heart. What? What a shock. I mean, Paul murdered Christians. And he, had let, he even got letters to do it legally and throw them in jail. I mean, he was so bad that when Christians heard he was saved, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. Yeah. I mean, these are the men and women on whom God builds the church. This is this, because he can't find perfect ones because they don't exist. So, so when you hear a leader stumbled and fell, how does that have anything to do with your faith? Were you worshipping a man? No. You're worshipping God, the only one who is perfect. In the Bible, only Jesus is perfect. Yeah. And you know, people get offended by leaders and they walk away from their discipleship group. They walk away from their church. I can't stand that church anymore. I can't be there when that man is preaching anymore. I can't even look at her, look at me. It's like, what's your problem? You think you're perfect? You're not. By the way, let me just tell you this. When you truly understand confession and you understand how wicked you are before God, you will forgive all the people in your life who have harmed you. Yeah, you will not have problems forgiving, by the way. Yeah. The only reason you don't forgive is because you look down on other people and you think highly of your own righteousness. That's why you're struggling with forgiveness. Yeah. It's a thing that's causing you not... That's why you say, my husband, I can never forgive what he did. I can never forgive. Remember the parable of the, the servant who was forgiven a million dollars? And then he went and found a guy who, who owed him like 50 bob and threw him in jail. That's exactly who you are. You don't understand. You're overconfident in your self-righteousness. Yeah. And, 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 and you need to understand that people have problems. And, and, and you, can't, you can't stop following God because of offense. Some people are even offended by God. I know people who left Christianity and left the church in Mavuno because God offended them. I prayed for somebody and they died. And that was it. That's the last time I ever prayed. I can't have anything to do with a God like that. I, 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 I was in fasting. I even fasted for them. I fasted for that job and I was fired. And it's like, how? I, 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 I prayed for that marriage, but my husband still walked away. And I walked away from God as well. Any God who cannot defend me does not deserve my allegiance. By the way, I've actually had people say words like those to that effect in this church. And some people, they come to church still, but they have no joy. They lost their joy because God disappointed them. And they're actually offended by God. But don't you understand it's because you don't know Scripture that you're offended? Because First Peter talks about the fact that you will face troubles. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 16. He says, dear friends, do not be surprised. Why are you surprised? It's because you don't read the Scripture. Scripture already told you, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, fiery trials are part and parcel of your salvation. Okay, some people are not saying amen to that one. But I hope the Spirit is revealing something to you right now. So that when the trial comes, you will not backslide. You need to understand every saint in the scriptures went through fiery trials. It's nothing to surprise you. It says, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And it says, if you're insulted 
because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. If you suffer, ha, it should not be as a murderer or thief. Or, in other words, it's not just, we're not just talking about any kind of suffering here. If you stole from work and you're being reprimanded, don't bring God into that one. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about things that are happening to you that you did not bring on yourself. And it says if you suffer, if, you're in so, uh, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer, thief, or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Suffering is part of your package, God's people. It's even a sign that God is with you. Yeah, because if you haven't met the devil recently, it's because you're walking in the same direction. So, so when you're attacked by the devil, it should show you, aha, ha, I'm doing something that is scaring the man. I'm doing something that is causing problems in his kingdom. That's why I'm receiving attack. So my suffering should not be a sign of, oh my God, oh my God, what, what's wrong? It's like, yeah, 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 we prayed. No wonder we're having this persecution. Now let's pray again and cast the man out. The Bible says resist him and he will flee. Yeah, our suffering. The Bible says, uh, there's somebody who once said that your, your opposition is a sign of your strong position. If the devil is not opposing you, it's because you have no position of threat on his kingdom. Yeah. So your position is a sign. It's not something to make you freak out. It's a thing to make you feel, okay, I'm well positioned. That's why our marriage is going through problems. Yeah. There are spiritual forces here. That's why we're being attacked. That's why our children are, are going through the problems they're going through. We are under attack. There's a big target on us. Amen. Praise God we are doing something right. I rejoice that I've been counted as worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. That's what the disciples, the Bible tells us they were whipped and beaten and they came out rejoicing that they had been seen worthy of suffering for the name. Oh, come on, somebody. When you're like that, you're unbeatable. You're unshakable. There's nothing they can do to you. They fire you, you come out saying, thank you, Lord, I represented you in that company. In fact, now I can even go for gathering every day. <laughs> Until you give me another job. Yes. That's an By the way, when you have an attitude like that, you actually are unshakable. God helps you to become unshakable. So offense and bitterness at God or others is one of the most effective ways that the devil causes Christians to backslide. Wow. And if you are nurturing offense today, you need to be able to understand this is actually the devil's bait. It's the enemy's bait to cause you to backslide. Our theme verse this year, it begins with the words, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. I really believe that the Lord wants us to stand firm, to let nothing move you. Let me just say, I thank God for this verse because God knew things would happen that would want to move you. Things would happen that would cause you not to stand firm. And that's why he gave us this verse. You know, in the last days, Jesus talked about the fact that many would fall away in their faith. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, there's a very interesting scripture, Matthew 24, 10. And it says, at that time, in fact, it's still 14. It says, at that time, this is the last days. He's talking about the last days. How many people know we are close to the last days if we're not in the last days? Yeah. The many signs of the last days are happening. And Jesus says, at that time, uh, he says, many will be offended. <laughs> you see that word? Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Wow. Verse 11. Then many false prophets would arise and deceive many. I believe the time is coming, by the way. Wow. False prophets. It's interesting. I find that very interesting because it talks about false prophets. And there's been a rise in recent times of prophetic ministries. And I have nothing against prophetic ministries. But I believe it didn't say false apostles or false teachers. There's a reason he talked about false prophets. And there are many prophets today who come and prophesy and collect disciples and tithes, and then they leave. They're not there to care for the sheep. And the Bible predicted that false prophets would arise and deceive many. And then verse 12, it says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many. Are you seeing that? It's not talking to non-believers. It's talking to people who had love. They were passionate for Jesus. But it says, the love of many will grow cold. Verse 13. But he, come on, let's read it together. Oh, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. 
oh, come on, somebody. I love that scripture. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Many are going to fall. You know, when we were in college, one of our, one of our uh, discipleship leaders had in a, in a retreat as we were graduating, we are in a ministry called SALT. That we, we, uh, any Saltarians in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we were part, we were the first SALT group. And we were having a retreat at the end of SALT, uh, finishing campus, getting ready for the workplace. And we had one of our speakers, a great man of God, he's called Cosma Gatera, and he was one of our speakers. And he came and he spoke to us. And we were sitting there, we were on fire for Jesus. We had had an amazing time doing ministry in campus. Uh, we had seen many people saved, salt had grown. And I remember he talked to us and he said, count in a row. We're sitting in rows. And he says, how many people are in a row? He said, we had one, uh, ten. He said, in the next ten years, only three out of ten in this room will still be as on fire for God wow. as right now. And then he said, of the remaining seven, only four will still be actually walking with Jesus. And he said, the balance will no longer have faith. And he said, I want you to make a decision today which part of that statistic you're going to belong to. Wow. And I remember that time making a decision and saying, God, I will be among those ones who are on fire for you, whatever it takes. You know, the crazy thing is, it actually happened. When I look at the statistics, there's a whole bunch of us who are Christians today, but they're not as on fire for God. Ministry is not their heart. It's not their passion. Their jobs are their passion. Money is their passion, but they come to church. Then there's a segment of us who are not even in church anymore. We're not even following Jesus. And I can literally tell you the three out of ten who still love the Lord, who are still on fire for God, who are still serving Him right now just like we were in college. You have to make a decision, God's people. This thing will not be decided for you. The love of many will grow cold. Yeah? How many are you in your row right now? Just count. Huh? There's 11 in that row. Eh? <laughs> statistics. He wasn't being a prophet. He was saying, these are the statistics. Not everybody in that row will have the same faith in the next 10 years. That you can actually take time out of your work and come and serve God and just listen to a gathering waiting on God expectantly for him to bless your ministry and to show you what to do in your job. That's what you're saying. And I believe for us at Mavuno, the statistics must be different. Come on. They must be different. But it's going to start with a decision that, Lord, I will stand. Tell your neighbor, I will stand. I will stand. Tell your other neighbor, I will not be shaken. I want, to just, I want to conclude and send us out for tea, but I just want to conclude in prayer because I know that there are some people who are here who are listening to this message and you're very convicted. And there are some of us who are in that place where you're saying, yes, God, I want to respond to this message. There are some people here who you've been shaken in recent times even. But today you're going to tell God, Lord, I will stand. Lord, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I will no longer be a divided Christian. I'm going to put you first. I will no longer be content for the shallow end. I'm going to be a deep Christian. I'm going to do everything it takes for me to grow. I want to be that Christian. There's somebody here who's going to say, Lord, I will not allow the word to enter one ear and come out the other. From today, something is switching in my life. I'm putting Jesus first. And I want to just pray for us as we make commitments. Somebody here needs to say, I will be among that percent that is on fire for God in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years. I will be vital in my old age. At 85, like Caleb, I will be saying, give me that mountain. I will still be conquering mountains for the kingdom until the day the Lord calls me home. There are a few people I sense that God uh, right now is putting that conviction in your heart. And you're saying, I am going to be that person. Even in my old age, I will still be making disciples. Even in my own age, people will still be coming to see me because I have solutions from the word for them. I want to be that Christian. But even as I pray, and I want to pray for that group, I just sense there might be some here who right now as we speak, you are a backslidden Christian. You're not walking with Jesus. You've not given him your life. Maybe you've given it to him a long time ago, but you walked away from your faith. Somehow God brought you to the gathering in his mercy. And he's spoken to you and arrested your heart today. And you're sensing that God is saying, today is the day you make the commitment back to me. I want to just pray for you before I pray for anyone else. And if there's anybody else who's never given their life to Jesus, but you've understood why today you must, I want to pray for you as well. So if you am going to ask you to do a brave thing, just raise your hand and then put it down again. Would love to pray for you. Just raise it up wherever you are. If you're here and you're saying, Pastor, I see that hand. To God be the glory for you, my sister. Anybody else? Be bold enough 
be man enough, be woman enough and just say, pray for me, pastor. I've been walking away from God. I haven't had faith. Ah, my first love died a long time ago, but I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to come back to his loving arms. I want to follow my God. I want to walk in the purpose I was created for. Just raise it up and then put it down again. You must be here. I know you're here. The Lord brought you here. He's told me you're here. I see you at the back. To God be the glory. I see another hand at the back. To God be the glory. I bless God for you. Every one of you. Hey, listen, it's not a pastor you're responding to. It's the Holy Spirit. You had it. God is here. His presence is here. And He's calling His sons and daughters back to Him. I really believe in this weekend we'll see prodigals coming back home. Yeah, this is what God is doing right now. Anybody else who's saying, Pastor, pray for me. I don't want you to miss the chance. This could be the very reason you came for this gathering. This could be the very reason this year that you connected with this church. And God just is calling you back home urgently because you have work to do. I see a hand at the very back to God be the glory as well. Thank you so much. Can we just appreciate all these people to God be the glory for you. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want to pray for you personally. So I'm going to ask you for those of you who raised your hand. I would love to give you a hug and welcome you back to the family personally. So please come up, come up, come up, come up quick. I'd love to just welcome you myself. Come, 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 come. Let's cheer them as they come. Woo! Welcome home. Welcome, brother. Amen. Let's go for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come, 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 come. There's room. Welcome, my brother. Welcome. Stand right there. Welcome. 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 Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome, 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 welcome. Oh, praise God for you. Oh, my Take my cross and follow you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Jesus, you're the one I follow. I'm going to pray for you in a second, no? I give you my today, tomorrow. Forever, Lord, I promise to. Take my cross. Just put out your hands in front of yourself. This is your commitment. You're not saying these words to a pastor. You're saying them to your God in heaven. The one who loves you so, so much that he brought you here to encounter him. You're saying this to the one who is going to help you to stand because you will never, ever fall in your faith. Uh, you're, you're saying this to the one who brought you to this family to establish you so that you will achieve the purpose that God has for you. And that purpose is greatness for every single one of you. I'm going to invite you to say a prayer after me. And for all of you who've made this prayer your own, if we would just repeat the words together with them, just to encourage them. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I come to you today, I come to you today, to give you my life, to give you my life. Forgive my sins, forgive my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and embrace me as your child. And embrace me as your child. From this day forward. From this day forward. I will follow you. I will follow you. I am yours. I am yours. My life belongs to you. My life belongs to you. All of me belongs to you. All of me belongs to you. And nothing else will keep me away from you. I want you to just lift your finger up to the heavens and say, Devil, Devil. From, this day forward, from this day forward, me and you are finished. Me and you are finished. I will never serve God divided anymore. I, will never serve God divided anymore. I belong fully to Him. I belong fully to you. So get your hands off my life. So get your hands off my life. Get your hands off my family. Get your hands off my family. Because the Spirit is in me. And I belong to Jesus I belong to and, to him alone. and to Him alone. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.
Let's just appreciate every single one of them. Praise God. Wow. Bless God for you. I'm going to ask you if you would just do me a, just for a second, as before, just before tea for a few minutes, follow Pastor Maish, and he'll just take, a few, just take your contacts, say a prayer over you, and then after this, we're going to send you some information and make sure we walk with you as a family. You will not do this alone, by the way. We promise you that. Amen. So please follow Pastor. Let's appreciate them as they do that. Wow. Bless God. Bless God. Bless God. He's such a good God. Ah, he's such an amazing God. All right, I'm going to pray for the rest of us before we have our tea. And maybe there's somebody here who just needs to be on their feet right now, speaking to their father and saying, God, I will follow. You've understood. There are people who had more faith than you who fell. There are people who did greater things for God than you have that fell. You need to make your commitment before your father and say, Father, with your help, I will be among those who will never backslide. My faith in you will never be shaken. Come on, make a resolution. Because it says, stand firm. God won't stand firm for you. You have to choose to stand firm. Say a prayer before God. Just raise your voice before your father for a minute before I pray for you. And just commit yourself to following Jesus. Commit yourself to walking with him. Commit yourself and say, God, I will hold on to you. I want to be passionate for you all my life. I don't want to be a background Christian, a backbencher Christian. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. Father, thank you for every prayer that is coming up to you, every commitment by a son or daughter here who's saying, I'm going to put Jesus first, Jesus first in my family, Jesus first in all I do. Uh, even if it means it costs me, I will follow him. Even if no one else does it, I will follow him. I will be, I will be passionate about my faith. I'm not going to allow it to be on the back burner. Thank you, Lord, for every prayer. And now I just pray for you, God's people. And I commit you to the one who is able to keep you from falling mm -hmm. and to present you without spot or blemish yes. on that final day. Yes. I, I, I commit you to him who is able to fill you with his spirit yes. and to walk with you. I commit him to you. I, I commit you to him who has your purpose already, yes. who has your victory already in your hand yes. and is just waiting for you to walk with him. And I declare over you, the devil has no, he has no part of your faith. He cannot touch you. He will not come between you and your father. I speak over you that the Lord will give you a passion for prayer and for the things of God. And you will love God first above everything else. And that all other things will be added unto you. And so I speak blessing, this blessing over you, God's people. We will rejoice. We will rejoice when we meet each other in heaven. And we will be able to say and, and hear those voices as Jesus says to every one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. I speak this blessing over you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and God's people say, Amen. Amen, amen. amen.